With the 2023 NFL Draft coming up, I am going through the best of every positional group in this class. This is the seventh adaptation of the series, this time going through the top 10 defensive linemen. With a solid amount of day one selections, these are the 10 best defensive linemen in the 2023 NFL Draft. I'm Chase Keller, and I hope you enjoy. Before I get into the video, I want to point out that this list only includes players I scouted as interior defensive linemen. There are also a few honorable mentions that just missed the list. From 11 to 14, I have Baylor lineman Siaki Ika, Florida lineman Gervon Dexter Sr., Oklahoma lineman Jalen Redmond, and Texas lineman Moro Ojomo. Kicking off this list is lineman Jaqueline Roy from LSU. Ranking everyone from 10 to 12 was difficult, but Roy comes out on top because of the overall upside that he brings. For a defensive tackle, Roy is athletic with further athletic upside that extends to working as a two-gapper. He is explosive off the snap and holds quick feet to set up effectiveness in both pass and run defense. At LSU, he was unproductive in the pass rush, but he has the athletic upside to grow into a wider elusive skill set. Roy is also heavily aware of the field, quickly adapting into the opposing quarterback's instincts. Throughout his film, I noticed him always jumping for passes, rarely being checked out on RPO plays, and always having a nice sense for the ball. Even when he is faked, he never checks himself out and is always fighting until the end of the play. With that being said, Roy's strength is fine, but his functional strength is not, and he is often too reliant on his athleticism to make plays. He is not elusive enough to work as a defensive end or fast enough to work as a linebacker, and he is too reliant on his athleticism to be a consistent defensive tackle. His lack of positional identity can be taken positively as an experimental piece or negatively as an extremely unready prospect. He is likely to stick with 4-3 defensive tackle, though. Overall consistency and instincts is an issue for Roy, and teams will cite that as a concern in the NFL. Nonetheless, Roy has the upside to be an effective starting defensive lineman if he can find his role on the field or if he can develop a consistent skill set. With the amount of concerns but solid upside, Roy gets a C grade, translating to a fourth round talent. Bold selection at number 9 with Wake Forest lineman Kobe Turner. An interesting selection nonetheless, but the film does not lie. And I noticed a high upside defensive tackle with the potential to be a massive steal in this draft. First, Turner is an all-around solid athlete with nice explosiveness from the snap and a good first few steps with overall quickness. He has hip movement with the potential to grow into a more elusive skill set, therefore giving him the positional versatility to throw into a 4-3 defensive end role if needed. He also has functional lower body strength to have bull rushing potential. He was often stuck up by stronger guards, but with this explosion, he can develop into a solid bull rusher. His strength is present through his tackling ability as he has tendency to knock the ball out from running backs with powerful hits. Turner is still a developing prospect though, and he can turn out to be a replaceable role player. His pass rush is still developing as he tries to find a go-to move in both elusiveness and power. He has a solid swim move, but that's about it. His leverage and hand placement is also a contributor to his lack of development in this aspect. It's almost like he puts his hands everywhere but the right spot, including too low, holding instincts, and other improper hand placement. It's also concerning noting that Turner did not start a single game at Wake Forest, but he did start 27 in four years at Richmond. Overall, Turner has a lot to work on, and I do not expect him to make an immediate impact. Yet, all of Turner's concerns can be developed, and he has great upside to be a top starter on the line. I'm giving Turner a C-plus grade, translating to a mid-to-late third-round pick. Coming in at number 8, I have Coastal Carolina's Jared Clark. The first of two linemen on this list outside of the Power 5, Clark continues the trend of these interior linemen so far. That trend, of course, being athleticism. Clark is 6'4", 334 pounds, and brings surprisingly efficient athleticism to the table. With this size, he is already a two-gap defensive lineman, but add on surprising athleticism and he solidifies himself as a true 3-4 nose tackle. Along with his athleticism, he has functional strength to knock back opposing guards off the snap. He's more quick and less explosive, but considering his size, he doesn't need elite explosiveness to knock back. He is also an extremely smart and focused pass rusher. He has a nice sense for the ball and is always aware of where it currently is. The problem with Clark is that he is a raw prospect. He can cut down weight and still develop into more of a physical and athletic specimen, but he still has several things he needs to improve on. 
One being his all-around leverage, including hand placement and footwork. Clark's hands were moved from his functional strength because of inconsistent strikes and low hand placement, and his footwork contributes to a lackluster balance which, for his size, may bring an injury concern. Clark should also look to capitalize on his athleticism through building an elusive skill set. He currently relies on his quick movements to get around blockers, but adding on a spin move or a swim move will be fantastic for him. Overall, Clark is a raw defensive lineman with great upside to become an efficient starter. He has a lot of underdeveloped traits that will hopefully translate to the NFL. I'm giving Clark a C-plus grade, translating to a mid-to-late third-round pick. The second prospect on this list outside of the Power 5 comes in at number 7, Carl Brooks out of Bowling Green. He's an interesting prospect who I can scout as both an edge and an interior defensive lineman, but the NFL Combine marked him as a defensive tackle. But he doesn't make the edge cut. On this list, he makes it easily, and he still deserves a shout out for his efforts with Bowling Green. Brooks is a reliable defensive lineman for many reasons, but it starts with his explosiveness off the line. The competition may have been low were playing in the MAC, but he was constantly winning pass rush snaps for this reason. Even against Mississippi State in 2022, he was winning a lot of snaps. He is also a gritty player who plays with high effort from snap to finish. He also pulled a lot of linemen his way to give teammates opportunities for pressures. He also started in 48 games across five seasons. All of these traits point to leadership, which with nice production at Bowling Green, it is a very important to note his reliability in this aspect. Of course, competition is something to note playing in the MAC. These lower-end prospects are always looked away from due to competition, one example being Tucker Craft of South Dakota State, who in my opinion has the upside to be the best tight end in this draft class. As a player, though, he has iffy run defending skills that will be tested at the next level. It's not easy to defend against some of these elusive backs, and referring to competition again, he will have to adjust greatly. He also has okay functional strength, which is under average for a defensive tackle. That's going to be tested in the NFL with bigger and stronger guards. I could see Brooks playing anywhere on a 4-3 defensive line, and I'm really pushing for him to adapt into the next level competition. Despite the lower end, he is a developed and talented pass rusher who has a lot of translatable and developmental traits for NFL teams. I'm giving Brooks a B- grade, translating to a late second to early third round pick. At number 6, I have lineman Byron Young from Alabama. Young's tape was a pleasant surprise, and he almost contradicts the previous four prospects with a pro-ready tape. Young's leverage is top-notch in this class. He has solid balance, and his point of attack is fantastic, making him one of the more consistent defensive linemen in this class. His smooth leverage creates him into a versatile one-gap and two-gap defensive tackle. His versatility extends to alignment versatility as shown in Alabama's cover 7 defense. Young lined up as a D-end and a DT, seeing success everywhere on the field. I noticed more success on the inside, making sense why he's being scouted there, but he also showed a high win rate on the outside too. On the flip side, Young lacks a top-notch lateral movement which may stick him to the inside of the line. He has solid all-around functional strength and athleticism, but improvements needed to his lateral movement may take away two gap consistency. He also lacks a nice explosiveness off the line, and with only a solid functional strength, he may be shut down by nicely ran offensive lines. Take Auburn, for example, where he highly struggled to stay productive and only registered one tackle all night. Speaking of, he has a short tackle range that may not be able to be improved at the next level. Byron Young played in one of the best defensive schemes in all of college football, where many non-elite prospects have lost ground in the NFL. Yet, I think Young can stay as a consistent starter in the NFL. I'm giving Young a B grade, which translates to a mid-second round pick. Getting into the top five, I have Mozzie Smith out of Michigan. I could see Smith going high or falling low depending on team priorities. Smith falls right into the draft projection of not being a top-heavy guy, but not being a day-three depth guy. Smith is an elite run defender as a prospect. He has fantastic gap control that may not extend to a two-gap defender, but he moves and tackles very well for a 6'3", 323-pound guy. He is always doing what he can do in the gaps, and hopefully that helps him tap into undiscovered potential in the NFL. The problem with that, though, is that he is strictly a run defender. In the pass rush, he is absolutely a non-factor. He struggles to get past the line and is not as powerful as you would think. Yet, he is fantastic where he is at. To add on to his lackluster pass rush, he struggles against fast tempo offenses. Jordan Davis had a lot of concerns with the stamina, though, and he worked out in his first season. Continuing on with the positives, Smith is a smart and aware rusher with a solid length. 
and he is rarely affected by elusive moves that can still make a tackle in both open field and in tight spaces. As I said, his gap control is fantastic, and running backs who test him will pay the price. As a prospect, Smith is an elite run defender and will 100% stay that way in the NFL. Yet, to be an elite lineman, he will need to develop his pass rushing skills and instincts and grow outside of just a run defender. I'm giving Smith a B grade, translating to a mid-second round pick. Staying in the Big Ten, number four is Wisconsin lineman Keanu Benton. I'm going to be completely honest, I knew nothing about Benton going into this video, but his tape was a pleasant surprise for me. Just like Smith, Benton is a fantastic run defender with great gap control, but he extends past the line of scrimmage unlike Smith. He is a powerful defender who can bull rush to a quarterback, and while not efficient in the pass, he can take away several options in the run. He is also a decent athlete and can chase down a running back on stretch plays. He has also started 36 career games for Wisconsin in four seasons, including as a freshman, and he saw considerable production with 80 total tackles, 9 sacks, 3 pass deflections, and 1 forced fumble. With the team that has been good throughout his seasons in a great conference, that's some fantastic production. On the downside though, Benton is very strict to his position on the line and doesn't have a lot of scheme versatility as a prospect. To fully expand on his potential, he will need to be drafted as a nose tackle in a 3-4 scheme. I definitely see the Packers picking him up to also stay in state. He also has some leverage issues primarily with his pad level staying too upright and getting stuck up by some stronger guards. He is also a little slow on his feet giving more reason to stick him into a nose tackle role. Benton to me is an enticing prospect who should be looked at as a day two selection. He may have a lack of versatility but he is a fantastic run defender who can elevate past the line of scrimmage. Benton gets a B grade for me translating to a mid second round pick. On to the top three. Now, these three players make this class top heavy, and it starts with Clemson lineman Brian Breesey. I've been following Breesey since high school, and while he didn't play much with Clemson, he's still as great as I remember. Breesey has fantastic lateral movement, especially for his frame at 6'5 and, and 298 pounds. He has great footwork, great swim moves, a solid spin move, and others. Because of these movements, he was consistent at getting pressures with Clemson. With Clemson sort of switch up defense, Breesey played a lot of different positions and was efficient in every one of them. Him, Miles Murphy, KJ Henry, and Tyler Davis did form one of the best defensive lines in the country, and he and Murphy were constantly exchanging spots across the line, so Breesey does have that positional and alignment versatility that teams value so much. He also has a nice eye for the ball and constantly finds ways to impact a play, whether it's always attempting to block a pass or trying to get to the quarterback before the pass. I said earlier that Breesey didn't play much with Clemson. He has a redshirt sophomore who played 25 games across three seasons and many things got in the way. He tore his ACL in 2021, got surgery on his shoulder during 2022 spring practice, lost his sister to cancer in early 2022, and dealt with the kidney infection just a month later. As a player, Breesey has some leverage problems, primarily with his pad level being too high and commonly being stuck up by stronger guards. He also can use some improvements in run defense when it comes to tackling, losing backs on elusive moves, and other minor concerns. If it wasn't for the injuries, Breesey would likely be number two on this list and a top 10 prospect in this draft. It was a tough career to battle at Clemson, but when he's on the field, he is fantastic. I'm giving Breesey an A- minus grade, translating to a mid to late first round pick. The runner-up to an obvious number one is pit lineman Kalijah Cansey. Cansey's film is just crazy to me, and he has a lot of similar traits to Aaron Donald as a prospect, who's another former pit lineman. Cansey's most notable trait is his athleticism. He is the most athletic defensive tackle in this class, and he showed out at the combine, running a 4.6740 with a crazy 1.64 split. On tape, his speed is very present with nice elusiveness and quickness on his feet. His athleticism allows for a versatile upside at the next level, especially given his undersized nature. He is still developing into his role on the line, so with an athletic skill set like his, he has crazy versatile potential. On the flip side, he does have his frame issues. As I said, he is undersized, but that's an understatement. He measured at 6 foot 1, 281 pounds at the combine which is both in the first percentile for defensive tackles. Because of his size, there are massive translation issues for him at the next level. It's not uncommon for an NFL tackle to be athletic, but for one to be an undersized athletic beast is something that the league doesn't typically see. Standards may be set at defensive tackle, and Cansey doesn't fit them. 
Also, because of his frame, he was commonly stuck up by offensive guards in college, and that will get even worse in the NFL. The thing with Cansey is if he can work past the standards just like former pit tackle Aaron Donald did. He did it, so why can't Cansey? I loved his tape, and I think he will become an elite DT in the next level. I'm giving Cansey an A grade, translating to an early to mid first round pick. The clear-cut number one and one of two projected Hall of Famers for me is Georgia lineman Jalen Carter. While controversy has continued to build on for him, the film doesn't lie and he is absolutely an elite prospect. Carter is great in both the pass and the run and he has so many traits that contribute to his overall skill set. His combination of size, power, and athleticism is extremely rare to find in a prospect. He has so many different ways he can maneuver around blockers with this combination, and I saw a lot of swing moves, spin moves, elusive moves, bull rushes, and about everything you can ask for. Perhaps my favorite thing about Carter is his body control and balance, where he can take hits, he can lose momentum, and he always stays up and still stays at the pad level he needs to stick with. And he is still developing too. He developed every year at Georgia, and while he still has some minor leverage concerns, he has the upside to be as good as Aaron Donald or even better. Along with Will Anderson, Carter is a prospect that seems good to be true. He has no concerns outside of one which is his character. With the situation where he was charged with reckless driving and presumably gained a bunch of weight because of this situation, and even before the season he had apparent issues, it's definitely a concern. Now how do I combat that? I bring up Micah Parsons. He fell due to character issues and now he's one of the best defenders in the NFL. I'm not disregarding the concern, but he is still one fantastic player. Do I think Carter will be the next Aaron Donald? Not particularly, but I do think Carter is the next elite defensive lineman. For that reason, Carter gets an A-plus grade for me, transferring to a first overall pick talent and Hall of Fame projection. I hope you enjoyed this top 10 defensive lineman list. Did you agree? Did you disagree? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I'm Chase Keller from Chase Keller Journalism, and thank you guys so much for choosing this channel as your source of sports coverage. See you guys in the next one.